It was really funny. The biggest comment I got, and I feel like you might have been able to guess, was the Catholic priest scandals and sexual abuse mm. scandals. I know, that's, that's a great sadness, right? Because, first of all, it, it shouldn't, isn't something that should ever have happened. It should have been handled so mm. differently in a lot of places. A lot of places did it right, but a lot of places didn't, and especially initially. Um, and you had a lot of um, understanding, even from psychologists, of you know, well, send this guy to therapy, and you know, he'll be fine, and they would say he's fine, and mm -hmm. so, um, so it's such a mix of things. So it's sad and it's horrible, and you know, it's mm -hmm. something that's a reality. Uh, at the same time, the church has done, I think, major things to move okay. forward and be responsive to it. And of course that never gets reported or that, that's not, a, that, so now people have this. Yeah, it's very sad because the movement such an stigma. attitude. Terrible. The whole approach now is, is um, the church in the U.S. is really, uh, I think, woken up to mm. the situation. And so first the, the, this thing called the charter, it's commonly referred to, the charter was um, put into place by the bishops that basically requires um, all priests, but not only priests, everybody who works in the church or is volunteering in the church uh, even with the children, in the office. everybody, okay. um, to go through a training program on awareness. Uh, of abuse and like how um, to spot maybe if it's going on and exactly what are the signs you know what are the signs of grooming what are the signs mm. of someone maybe overstepping boundaries even even if they're not uh, you know they don't have ill intent but it's like you know what that's a, that's not appropriate and yeah. right and just so it's an acknowledgement and raising the awareness level um, so that everybody's eyes are um, able to, and ears, are able to detect and mm -hmm. then have reporting requirements. So if, if someone suspects something's going on, whether it be within the church or in, say, a child's family or some mm -hmm. other way, with, um, that they have a duty to, yeah. to say something and to do something about it. And how do you think it started happening? Because I'd imagine it was one case somewhere not connected just a lone wolf event but then the reputation is all priests the entire church it's a whole just basically like pedophile ring how how did that even start well i think you you know you have first the 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 media um that takes a, a situation and reports big time on something that's a big target the church mm -hmm. is a huge target so yeah. it's assumed that you know, I mean, if people stop and think about it, I don't think they assume this, but there's a presentation almost like, well, the Pope knows right now I'm sitting here talking to you, right? Because that's how the church works. And it's, like, and it's just not realistic, right? Mm -hmm. it, it is a massive um, mm -hmm. uh, enterprise, if you will. It's a, the, the church is, is ancient and it's, it has so many facets and so many parts to it. And yet we, we do talk about a, a centralized um, leadership of, with both the Pope and the bishops. Top down. Yeah, in that, in that mode of, of, um, kind of governance. accountability and governance, right? Yeah. And it's one of the things that has helped sustain the church, too, mm -hmm. through difficult times, is having a unity mm -hmm. that even when there's a lot of disagreement, there certainly is a lot of disagreement today, um, the, the church maintains its unity because of its structure in many ways. Um, so, so I think part of it is there, there's a, a, a kind of a, a presumption or an imputation of if it happened here, it's happened everywhere sort because of thing. Because almost there was an order um, from your higher-ups to do this or like that's... Because some people think the ultimate conspiracy is the entire church is built to do that. Yeah, which is just absolute nonsense. <laughs> It's nonsense. Yeah. You know, the, the, the church has, has and continues to be such a powerful leader mm -hmm. in works of mercy and charity and mm -hmm. education and in so many, many ways. 
um, that to try and create a thought process like that is just ludicrous. Yeah. Right? Um, the other is looking at just the percentages in professions in general. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had some of this other stuff come out. The, the things that happen with the Boy Scouts, the stuff that's oh. happened with coaches, the stuff that's happened with dentists. With, so, I mean, it's, but you're not looking at like, well, one dentist is connected to all the dentists in the country, right? Everybody recognizes that those are isolated things. Where with the church, it, it, it tends to be all clumped together. Yeah. And so it's, it's like it's un- a club. That yeah. Everyone, yeah, it's very unfair, you know. Um, and yet, I, 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 again, you know, I think it's crucial to, and this is what I think a big thing a lot of the bishops have done in a very important way is they've acknowledged. They've met with victims. They've apologized for things that had happened. Most of the time, those bishops were not even bishops at the time, maybe not even ordained because so many of those cases, you know, they took a a period of 75 years or whatever. And and so you say, this is all that happened at all. And and so it's important to take it apart piece by piece and understand it, I think. Um, not ever excusing it, ever, ever. Yep. It, it, there's, there's no excuse, and there, there was a standard there that um, was uh, it, unhealthy, you know. Mm-hmm. And and it's the, the the standard being that somehow priests or um, bishops or anybody who works in the church is on a, a pedestal or in a higher place of some kind, which yeah. is nonsense. As soon as we do that to ourselves. We create a falsity. It hurts so bad because here is a, a organization, the church, that's supposed to, I guess, frown upon that and make sure that it doesn't happen and bring greatness to the world. And so maybe that's also why it's, it feels like a shock because mm. you think it would be the last place that would happen, but it, it happens. No, right? absolutely. I think that's true. You know that that uh, there there should be a, a higher. Um, level of concern and, and awareness there, which is why I think it makes it so shocking. When this starts coming out for, for so many of us, especially in the West, because it hit big time in the East first, mm-hmm. um, so many of us were just shocked, like, what? how can this have happened? Yeah. You know, because they were going back again 50 years or whatever time frame, right? And, um, and it, it shocked all of us, you know, those in the seminary, those who were already ordained yeah. uh, it's like wow it's what would be the punishment obviously there's a bunch of legal recourse but in the church it would probably be excommunication i believe yeah and so you know taking the, the authority of if it's a priest taking the authority of his ordination away and mm. and then um, excommunication certainly because of the the violation of mm-hmm. um, the trust and everything that happened and um, and then the criminal ones. I mean, that's another very important step we've made clear. It's mm-hmm. like if somebody comes forward and says something, and we say, go and talk to the police, that you should mm-hmm. be part of your what you're doing here, you know, yeah. uh, and how important that is. And I would even see some people who would say, well, it doesn't matter if you tell someone in the church because they're all in on it and they'll keep it a secret. Right. And see, and that's... Is that just wrong? That's just wrong. I mean, that's the conspiracy theory stuff, right, that's yeah. out there for so many other topics as well. It's it's, it's just not the case, yeah. you know. Uh, has that happened? Did that happen in some of these cases that went? Uh, probably. I mean, that's yeah. part of what, you know, what, what uh, caused even more of the scandal when a mm-hmm. bishop would just move a, a priest around, you know, yeah. uh, instead of, of dealing with the issue. And in some of those cases, again, the ones that were older, um, that was sometimes the advice given. You know, it's yeah. like, well, you know, this is a bad environment. Let's send him to therapy for a while and, mm. and you know, get his head straight and then he'll be able to move on. Um, so, uh, so you had a lot of factors involved there, you know, but, mm. but the, the concept that, well, there's no point in telling people because it's not going anywhere. It's like, no, especially now with, we have very set procedures. So somebody comes and tells me something um, that they suspect about another priest or they tell the secretary here or whatever, they have a duty to then first say, please go to the police, right? That's, you, that's a very important point. Mm-hmm. We'll take it 
to you know the people here who need to know whoever whoever is above that person yeah. and take steps to get it addressed immediately if you die tonight would you go to heaven well uh, I would like to think yes uh, if not immediately in time uh, mm -hmm. what we would call time um, mm -hmm. by way of uh, final preparation to meet God so okay. I, I think that we overstate um, the fear of um, not being with God after we die. Um, there is, I think, a very important understanding of the mercy of God that sometimes gets undertaught mm -hmm. uh, and that we believe in God's mercy. And, you know, if, if a person has lived a, a good life and trying their best to live a good life, if they have embraced their faith and mm -hmm. followed it to the best of their ability uh, and uh, that if they die suddenly um, and uh, are maybe not in a good place, maybe something they just did was terrible or they didn't do something or whatever, and, you know, I don't believe that God's mercy stops when we do uh, and and when we die I think God's mercy continues yeah. and one of the ways that the the uh, church kind of responds to that is the concept of purgatory which has mm -hmm. been often misunderstood and misused um, but, ghosts all around us well that's it's not so much that but a sense of um, that purgatory is where you go and burn for a while, like you burn in hell kind of thing, mm. uh, and that's your suffering for your sins. And that's really not, I mean, of course, the word purgatory comes, uh, the, a, a smaller part of that word is to purge, right, to cleanse, to be cleansed, to be prepared. And so I like to look at it as uh, that if I die and I'm not really prepared to meet God, there's a period of preparation that I need to go through. And that's kind of where in all the cartoons, if you're in purgatory, there's something you need to do to be at rest. Or there's Right, sometimes there's that, right? Some of those yeah. movies, you've got to go back to earth and you know, save this person or do yeah. something right as a way. And, and those are all created concepts, yeah. you know, but I, do I, what, what is that purging like? I don't really know. Yeah. Um, but it isn't something that we, we teach as like he like hell for a short time. It, that's really not, and yet that's sometimes portrayed or understood yeah. that way. Um, but God's greatest um, desire is that we are all one with God as hmm. our Creator, and so there 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 is an important understanding to that. That's what I mean by God's mercy. Mm -hmm. God will do not overlook things because that accountability, I think, is something we all have to God ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's that mercy that is beyond our understanding. Let's say you're in an uncontacted tribe in the rainforest and you die and you've never heard about Jesus. Because you always hear if you just accept Jesus, then you can go to heaven. But what about for people that literally uh, no colonizer has ever came by and told you about Jesus? Um, what's the situation for that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think, again, that, yeah. that, and what is their moral development? What is that person's moral development? What is their moral code? And how has that person grown up and understood that code? And has that person lived that code in a good way? Um, so I think it's, it's not just saying the words, I believe in Jesus. I mean, it, it's way much, way more than that. I mean, yeah. it, like the it, funny you know. scene, it's a Family Guy episode. Hitler's in the bunker right before he kills himself. He's like, I believe in God. And it's, it's like, right. In, yeah. Right. It's a, so what, what has your life proven to yeah. be, right? Can ha people have deathbed conversions? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that happens. I think that a lot of times when people are faced with death, they have a whole different... Uh, ability to understand priorities and to look at life, right? So um, Absolutely. That, that yeah. can happen for sure. Um, and again, does that limit God's mercy? Because sometimes the people will like, they love to ask that question, well, is Hitler in heaven? Is it, I, my short answer is I don't know. I have no idea the state of his soul. Mm -hmm. I have no idea the state of his mind mm. uh, and his capacity in, in uh, making moral decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, when people are 
some are pathologic. I remember visiting a, a guy on death row and he talked about, he had gone through a, a conversion and understanding, but, but he talked about being, when he committed, he committed two murders and he said it didn't mean anything to me. He said it was like turning on a light switch. It was absolute, no conscience concept in there whatsoever. Complete psychopath. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so through, if I'm remembering right, in that case through therapy, but also through a journey of faith for him, and, and I mean a journey of um, life really that brought him to faith, um, he really had a change. Um, but uh, so I, if someone can do that um, on earth with human beings, how much more can God accomplish? Mm -hmm. um, so it's almost like if you have ethics that align similarly to, you know, the Church of Jesus, and you do your best as an imperfect human to align with those values and work towards them, even if you've never heard of Jesus, there's a chance. Absolutely. Okay. What happens when, if the values are inverted, like what we see with a lot of extremists who think their greatest duty is to kill people and they don't see them as innocent because they're corrupting the earth. When I was reading the Torah, the whole idea of it is, well not the whole idea, but if there's no God, we're in the abyss of moral relativism, mm. right? And so if there is no God, there are no true morals. So. Because there's God, there are true morals from God. And then that's, to me, the really hard part about finding peace among people with different ethics, especially when the authority of their ethics come from God, this unquestionable, omnipotent figure. If someone feels that they're fulfilling some duty of being good, but it's you know, someone in the West or someone in an individualistic society sees as bad, you know, would we say that is still objectively bad? I guess, how does the church wrestle with, you know, the obje objectivity of good and evil? Right. I mean, I, I think that uh, a couple of things. We recognize that there is um, objective truth and that we strive our best as human beings who experience subjectively that truth can be attained. Right? Uh, and what is, what is true in, in um, the, the religions uh, that of pretty much across the, the, the spectrum, they share the same basic values. Mm -hmm. um, and when someone takes a religion and uh, makes it uh, extreme, then they're not following. They can say, I'm following this religion, mm -hmm. uh, but they're not, they've lost it. They've taken it and subjectified it to a degree that they're justifying everything that they're doing. Yeah. Um, and I've seen that, you know, you can see examples of that in, in Christianity, you can see it in Islam, you can see it in Judaism, you can see it in Hinduism. Yeah. Um, I mean, it seems like in just about any faith, you, people can make it extreme. I've even heard critiques of Christianity of, you know, I've always thought Jesus is, you know, all loving, would never hurt a fly. And then there's some verses where it's like, whoa, did he just... Did he just hit that person? Did he just? I forget which verse. It's going into a temple. I forget. Well, in the, there's a story in the temple, uh, in a couple of the different gospels, um, of Jesus um, being angry and overturning the tables of those who were selling. And the the phrase that's most often remembered is Jesus saying, "Stop making my father's house a marketplace," because people were there selling all kinds of things, but especially they, there was a requirement that you had to purchase and, and exchange. Um, you couldn't use uh, Roman coins. You had to exchange them. So there was money being made by this exchange. And then there was this requirement of buying certain things for sacrifice and all this. And, and so the, the, the anger and the frustration um, comes from the 
misuse of religious law as well as the misuse of uh, human beings you know, mm -hmm. taking advantage of the poor. Um, so there isn't a, it, the, the strongest language, if I'm remembering right, says, and he drove them out, right? Um, so that we have in our minds, that means you were, you know, hitting people or pushing them or whatever. And um, we don't really have that, but could it have been? Yeah. Jesus was human also. So yeah. there is a sense of, of um, that the human nature that can move things as well mm -hmm. in the moment, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so um, it's, it's, it's an interesting story, but it's also one that you never take, well, therefore, that's Jesus, yeah. right? That, that in any place, and that's what I find when, when uh, we take something out of context, you know, one of my favorite phrases in looking at Scripture and using it is that a text uh, without a context is nothing but a proof text, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and you can make, any text almost say what you want if you're taking it out of its context. There's studies that show clear as day if you take a just a fact about a situation and you give it to one person on an extreme, say completely partisan Democrat, completely partisan Republican, give them the same basic statement that doesn't confirm or deny either side and both will use it to confirm their side. It's, there was another Lost gospel or something that I've I saw. Uh, who is the Judas? The gospel of Judas, where there, I don't know, because that's not a real gospel in the Bible. Uh, but I heard a story of when Jesus was a kid, and it was he like struck someone down. It was, he was playing with a kid, struck him down. Uh, it also goes into he was getting taught lessons from a professor. And, he knew the letter of Alpha better than the professor. And do you do you know the story? I'm talking? I, no? I, I'm not familiar with that particular story, oh, okay. but there are there are other texts out there called Gospels that were um, later than the Gospels that we have in the, in the four Gospels we have. Um, there's a Gospel of um, James. There's a Gospel of I, um, I want to say. Uh, Peter or Mary Magdalene. There may be. There's there's several out there. I've heard that and they're, too. Yeah. yeah, and they're they're uh, second century, third century. Some of them texts. I believe I've never spent any time studying them, so I'm no expert in those. Yeah, but they're not considered part of the canon of the Bible. That uh, when the church came together to discern what is the inspired word of God, um, that was the the process of discerning what should go in and go out and yeah. and so and those were um, were ones that either weren't known or were un, uh, decided that they weren't consistent there there, mm -hmm. there wasn't a, a basis for it to to show it being an inspired word of God a critique I've heard is when the church has been when they were trying to form their concise work, they were picking and choosing, right? And they left some things out to make it you know, be, like you said, more concise. And ultimately I've heard that as one of the huge arguments in Islam of the Jews and the Christians took the word of God how they wanted it to, translated the hell out of it, made it fit what they wanted to fit. And, and then the Muslims had the great enlightenment. Muhammad had the great enlightenment for the book. How much of the Bible has been altered to fit a narrative, or do you think that is the case? Yeah, I don't. I don't think that's it, the case at all, because the, the, the Bible doesn't have a single narrative in a way, um, and so it's comprised of, of many different books, different literary styles, different um, um, audiences that, that people were being written to, were were being spoken to, and then later written to. Um, so I think it's very different, and of course, Islam is 700 years later. So, to 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 come back and and reflect on um, the Jewish and Christian scriptures with that kind of, I haven't heard that critique before. But mm -hmm. if someone's making that kind of critique, it seems a little bit unfair mm -hmm. uh, in in that conclusion, right? Yeah. Uh, so, I've always thought it mm -hmm. was kind of crazy. The Gospels were compiled within one lifetime after Jesus 
died or ascended. Uh, but it took uh, like 150 years to compile the Quran after Muhammad died. And to me, I'm just thinking, you know, regardless if you're going to have a faith and believe in something that you can't prove and you have to just believe, to me, <laughs> someone could just say, they're all crazy. I don't want to believe anything like that. But if I was narrowing them down to say, maybe one of them is right, there was no firsthand account from anyone in Mecca or Medina about what was happening 700. No one knew Jesus. No one could say it's to me. That's I, I think that's crazy. But well, and I think they're they're different. It's a different path, right? So that you know there, there's a different inspiration and mm -hmm. uh, faithful Muslims who are um, following their understanding of who is God and, and doing their best and they've been formed in it through generations and so on and their families I think you know have the same sort of righteousness that uh, mm -hmm. you know a Christian would and or a Jewish person would you know, I mean I think it really there needs to be that sense of respect and understanding that when it's entered into purely and that's what I mean when I said you know, most of the, the all three of those for example um, recognizing Abraham as a connection, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the values are largely similar. Mm -hmm. right? My first book, it was focus on what unifies us, focus on the common values and goals. But then the hard part, I mean, it might just be especially with Islam, is the idea of Sharia law, where if you're Jewish or Christian, you have to pay a tax. And if you're one interpretation of who is corrupting the earth is anyone who is not following Islam and therefore their death is justified. To me, it's like even if 90% of the values are shared, but there are still one or two that can throw the whole thing off. How can we cooperate and live in a peaceful or ideal community relationship when there's people that their ideal community relationship is something that we think is completely wrong? Paying the jizza tax? How much of Islam do you know and study? Yeah, I mean, I, not that much, really. Okay. I, I've had more uh, relationships with Islamic people than had an opportunity to study their religion, okay. per se. And for yeah. the most part, when you come across someone who's Islamic, they're a great person. Right? Well, like my experience has been that, you know, yeah. that there's, a, there's, a, there's an openness and an interest in learning about each other's faiths and, mm -hmm. um, and trying, everyone kind of trying their best to live a good life. Right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think um, it, it depends, again, on how it's applied and all mm -hmm. of that. The Pope recently said uh, if you're trans, you can be a preacher or just a lot more acceptance of the LGBTQ folks into the church. And a lot of critiques online say that, well, being gay is against the word of God. It's a sin. All of these things, it's corrupting the earth, it's being bad. Why are we accepting them in and trying to make them a part of it? What do you say to that? Well, I, first of all, I think the Pope is misquoted so many times or is, again, something taken out of a context. And uh, then in media, uh, for good or for ill at times, mm -hmm. um, then splashes it all over the place and, and, and makes headlines out of something. Um, interestingly, our, our current pope really hasn't changed any of the doctrines or the teachings of the church. Yeah. What he's made clear is, I think, a couple things. One is we have to be willing to dialogue with one another to discern where is the Holy Spirit guiding us in issues such as transgender issues or gender confusion or same-sex attractions and mm -hmm. all of those. What, what is the Spirit saying? And the only way to do that is to listen to people and to welcome all people to come and dialogue. And if there isn't a sense of, I'm not going to be judged, I'm not going to step forward and dialogue with you, who would? Right? Mm -hmm. and, and so what I see, the, the primary thing the Pope is trying to do is to say, we have to be willing to dialogue and understand each other. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's a, a crucial uh, point. The, the second thing is, uh, as far as acceptance in various roles and so on, and, and uh, I think that uh, the, the Pope again is trying to say, what, where is our teaching and can, um, 
someone who's, say, transgender, can they be in the role of uh, a, a godparent, uh, for example? Um, and I think, again, we, we look to, well, what are the requirements for that? Mm -hmm. Role, you know, am I regularly practicing my faith? Am I, uh, if I, am I fully initiated in the church? Am I, am I in union with the church? Right, and that's the one that often gets people uh, in trouble, right? Because and, in union is supposed to be seen as doing what the church wants to be a good Christian, and being a good Christian means not sinning. Well, no, 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 right? Right. We, I mean, we know we all sin, right? It's, it, it, it's am I doing my best to live a life consistent with um, the teachings of the church? And, uh, and people who are married and divorced and never de dealt with that first marriage, for example, and they remarried. And, well, they may not be in full communion with the church as a result of that because of the teaching on marriage. And therefore, uh, well, they may not be a good godparent, right? That doesn't mean they're a bad person. It doesn't mean it's not a judgment on their soul. It's saying here are the requirements of this job. It's mm -hmm. a job description of a godparent. And there's a piece missing here because that person has um, made other choices in life and said, well, you know, I'm, I'm still considered a Catholic. They're good Catholics. And uh, they're not... Uh, good witnesses of that part of the teaching. Mm -hmm. And another thing I hear a lot, there's a guy who does street lectures and he has conversations. He's been showing up on my feed and a lady was yelling at him, you hate homosexuals. You teach that you hate homosexuals. What do you have to say about that? Does the church teach to hate homosexuals? Oh, absolutely not. And I think, that, I think that's where Pope Francis is been trying to equalize things some to say, wait a minute, that's never been the teaching of the church. And then people jump on it and say, well, that he's changing. No, it's never been the teaching of the church. Yeah. Uh, the, the issue it, that comes down to with, on, on sexuality is the teaching that says the gift of sexuality has two equally important purposes that require, that are, are both equally necessary in sexual activity between two people. And one is union, and the other is procreation. And that teaching um, has been consistent. And so that's, that's the, the, the um, I don't want to say that, that's where we can get stuck in the conversation mm -hmm. um, because procreation isn't possible in same sex um, unions. And so that's where the church has said that's where, why we can't have marriage and, as, a union. As, a, as a union in that same way. But that it's a whole different conversation. I mean, that's, that's called talking about marriage and sacrament and so on. And, and what is the purpose of our, the gift of sexuality? And that's where it seems like a lot of people get thrown off is they see, well, you don't have equal rights because you can't get married and you're gay you're less of a person, you're hated, it's, no, 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 no. Right, it's, it's, it's different, and it, it is nuanced. And, and yet I totally understand how, and I've had conversations with people who wrestled with that, who mm -hmm. are in a, in a union with the same gender, same sex, and they're, you know, they've been in that, maybe marriage for a long time, and they do feel lesser than, and that's where I think this, the conversation, the dialogue is so important. Yeah. Um, it's not the intention, but I certainly of the teaching, but I certainly understand the how the feeling could be that way and that emotion could be that way. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, "Hate this person." Is that a true statement? You'd say, right? Well, it's it. There's there's some places where the word "hate" is used in English and may or may not be a decent translation, but uh, most often it's hating the activity. Um, but there are, like in the Psalms, there's hating, uh, you know, hate the evildoer is used in some places and mm -hmm. so on. Um, but the, the teaching would be, the understanding of how we apply that would never be to hate a human being. Hate uh, what they do. But, but yeah, if something yeah. Is, is, you know, when, when someone uh, strikes out against a person, when, like the things that Jesus went after, right? Those people who were hypocrites, people who were... 
uh, treated the poor uh, uh, unfairly, people who took advantage of the poor, people yeah. who, you know, those things where there's people are not acting justly, um, you hate their actions, but you don't necessarily hate them. And, and that's a huge part of my last book. You can understand and have an idea what someone's doing is wrong, they should be stopped. You can have a deep hate and disgust for what they do, but trying to be mindful enough to not have that hate go towards the person. And the argument I try to use to help people with that is there's no free will, everything is conditioned, they have a probability of behaving. So hold people respon responsible and accountable, but don't put the blame on the person. How do we conceptualize God and Christianity? Because I've seen arguments that math prove the idea of God, of God is basically the laws of nature. How, how would you respond to that, as God being the laws of nature? Well, I would say that God's more than that. I mean, God created, if you will, the laws of nature, or we, we come to understand who God is as creator through what we call the laws of nature. Um, and for Christians, we would say that the best example of, of who, we, who is God that we have uh, on earth, or that is, of course, in Jesus Christ, that, that Jesus shows us the, that who is God. Um, but even that, of course, has its limitations. First of all, it's, you know, you and I didn't shake Jesus's hand, right? So yeah. we're relying on the scriptures that are translated how many times and all of that other things, right? And so then there's the movement of the Holy Spirit. And that's where, you know, that's the spirit that discerned, well, what with the church, uh, th what should be in the Bible, for example, the spirit that continues to inform us and guide us and help us understand who is God. Is God, because I, oh, I remember growing up, Jesus is in everyone, everything, all around us all the time. And that would make me believe God exists outside and is every bit everything in the universe as well. Do you say that would be true in a way? Or God isn't everything in the universe. God exists outside of the universe. But how, how would you wrestle with Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, um, it it's a, becomes a kind of a philosophical discussion too, right? And, but, but that God is greater than all God created. So therefore, God exists outside of the universe, outside of creation. Um, but that God is a part of what he created as well, because it is a, you know, especially human beings, but but really all things made in God's imagination and human beings in God's image. And so, uh, again, we're talking about God with language that we understand and that we yeah. can, right? So as soon as we do, I think it was Aquinas that said, right, as soon as you start to define God, you failed, right? So, mm. so there's those limitations, but it's what we've got to work with. And so we do our best to, and of course, People much more brilliant than I have said yeah. more complete things about how do we understand God. Um, but it's at various levels mm -hmm. that we understand God. Why is the Catholic Church so wealthy? They own the most amount of real estate. We've got no clue what's in the Vatican. How did they get there? Mm. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know what the statistics are about the Catholic Church versus other organizations, but I think there's some real misunderstandings, too. So the, the, the church, um, again, this seeing it as this monolith, right, this thing that is all over the world and so on, right? And it's a, but it, it is also comprised of human beings, right? Mm -hmm. And so we call the church the people of God, right? So the church um, is uh, the, the Catholic, I think this is still statistically correct, the, the Catholic church is the largest single um, denomination or faith tradition, you know, over um, a billion people, whatever the number is these days. Um, and so part of the quote-unquote wealth is the fact that 
it's all these people. It's a right? bunch of people. It's a bunch of people. Yeah. So, and the people have contributed to building churches and to making art and to, and so forth. And it's over a period of 2,000 2, years. years, right? So it's like the, the, the family uh, wealth, so to speak, that, you know, maybe you grew up in a, in a home and when your parents die, they're going to leave you a home with somebody else who grew up in an apartment. Their parents die and they have nothing, right? And so it's that sense of over time we see all... A civilization, right? It kind of builds on itself. So mm -hmm. um, I think that that's a, a, a piece of it. You also have what does wealth mean? You mm -hmm. know, uh, for example, one of the one of the great saints during the persecution in the early church, he was ordered by the emperor to bring forth the wealth of the church, and they were thinking, you know, bringing the the whatever, the, a chalice or whatever artwork or something, whatever, and he brought forth all of the poor. He said, this is our wealth. Mm. And so, it's, so part of it is, what is wealth? How do we define wealth? Someone has said, uh, you know, a, a particular painting is worth a million dollars. Well, I can auction it for two billion, right? So how do we understand wealth and what does all that mean? Um, the land that has been used to build churches on and so on. So much of that you know, donated land over the centuries. And mm -hmm. uh, so... So I think there are many reasons why there's that um, kind of, of wealth and many then that give that opportunity to be um, reaching out in the name of Jesus to the world mm -hmm. in so many ways. Yeah, I think that was the biggest point. If just on average, every member of the church gives 10% of their income to the church, that's probably a GDP more than America. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, that's crazy. Think, yeah. I think that's... And I would say that we, we probably don't. In fact, Catholics are, are known for not being uh, t terribly generous in the context of an overall 10%, like mm -hmm. some religions like Mormon. mandate it, right? Yeah. Uh, we don't. Uh, our only uh, question ever is that we're called to give to the poor to, and to support the church. And then it's up to each person to discern in, in their conscience, you know, well, what's God calling me to do? What can I do? And, and so on. Uh, so people will ask me sometimes, yeah, but Father, what's a number? Give me a number. <laughs> and I always go back to, well, your conscience has to be your number. But ultimately, as what's the guidance in the Bible? That's where the 10% comes, that there's some different figures in the Bible who contributed 10%, and so that's where that came from. Yeah. But you also had others who gave everything, and you had others who gave 50%. Yeah. So uh, for whatever reason, the 10% was stuck on, and that's... And then there's you know, the idea of take the vow of poverty and just give it all away. Correct. Like, so you know, okay. so there's, there's many. And that's another piece, that clearly, that contributes to the wealth. We had centuries of really brilliant people doing all kinds of works that were living in community. So that means, you know, they made a promise of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And so they didn't accumulate any wealth themselves, but as a result of whatever they were doing, building universities, doing, you know, teaching, doing whatever, that wealth has stayed in the community yeah. uh, that they're a part of. So you have that as well. Um, so there's many pieces to look at when looking at it. It isn't like, you know, Pope Francis has a, you know. A, it's a, like, where can I buy real estate to make this it, good return? Exactly. Yeah. And, and <laughs> or, or say here, oh, let's see, St. Thomas Cathedral has, you know, $100 in their bank account, so I'm going to, you know, use that for this. It's like, no, it, it, we're a separate entity, you know, legally. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's that as well, right? So it's, it is, it's not one big conglomerate thing. Uh, what's going on, y'all? My name is Kenneth Sher. Thank you so much for watching my video with Father Chuck. If you have any more questions you want me to ask him for the next episode, drop them down in the comments and I'll start making a list. Also, if there's anyone in the world you want me to do an interview with, if they're in the States, I'll fly out to them. If they're outside of the States, I'll Zoom with them. Let me know, start dropping comments, and I'll do my best to reach out to them. Also, if you want to support my work even more and help me make more videos just like this, please check out my book, Behaving As Us, on Amazon. If you purchase it, read it, it's the best way to help me fulfill my mission and continue making content just like this. All right, y'all, thank you so much, and I'll see you on my next video. Peace.